What's up, ATL? It's time for another edition of A to Z with Mark Zeno. It's your boy, John Michaels, in for Mark. Once again, he's off enjoying a little bit of family time with the vacationing family, the Zeno family. I don't know where they were at. They were on a beach, and they looked like they were having a good time. We got a lot we'll get into on the Locked On ATL podcast today. Talk some Braves. Obviously, what they're doing continues to be fantastic as the New York Mets are now getting closer and closer as the Braves are trying to make the move. We'll dive into the Falcons for a second because we've been doing some stuff on 680 The Fan. We're, we're kind of going over, is this team better or worse at different position groups? And it's almost shocking a number that we'll give you defensively that we have to get into. We'll get into the college football of it all as well as it looks like super conferences are here to stay and they're not going to be uh, much longer both for four, potentially the ACC, the Pac-12, and some others could be really looking for some dance partners. This segment of the program brought to you by our good buddies at Rock Auto, Rock Auto and rockauto.com. But let's start first and foremost with what's going on in college football. My favorite, if you follow me on social media at John Michaels U, you understand there's nothing I like better than a little bit of college football. Yeah, I'm a fan of the U. Don't, don't hold that against me. We haven't been good in a long time. But there's a lot going on college football-wise. We talked about this some on Friday. And more came out during the week. USC, UCLA apparently had been in negotiations with the Big Ten going back for a while. And it's kind of understood right now that Lincoln Riley may have known that they were leaving from the Pac-12 going to the Big Ten. But we'll see how that all plays out. The bigger thing with this now becomes a rumor that came out today. Dennis Dodd, CBS Sports, talked about the SEC potentially uh, you know, going out and finding some hired guns. Clemson, Florida State, Miami – all teams that were mentioned in the SEC. Now, the arms race is obviously tremendous right now in college football. It's kind of the haves and the have-nots. And I think what you're ultimately going to see before everything goes too far is at minimum three conferences, maybe of 20 teams each, split geographically east, west, north, south, however you really want to have that. And everybody else is going to be like scrambling for a home. But let's start with the idea of potentially Clemson, Florida State, or Miami going to the SEC. Two of those schools fit really well. Geographically, history, amenities, size of the stadium, people showing up to games. That's Clemson, national power, obviously, with what they've been doing in college football over the last few years. And it's Florida State, which is kind of funny to hear me say Florida State, but it's because Doe Campbell Stadium will get rocking to the tune of eighty to 85,000 people. And when that Seminole chant hits, it's absolutely amazing. Much as I can't stand the Seminoles themselves, it is a place that really has a rich tradition of college football. And they kind of fit in to the SEC footprint. You think about it. Clemson's already got a, a rival right now with South Carolina in conference. Florida State already has a rivalry right now with Florida in conference. None of that would have to go away at all if these teams were to come around and take shape. And again, it comes down to money. And we talked about this some on Friday. You're talking about the SEC potentially paying $20 million more per year to each institution than what's being paid currently with the ACC. Now, the ACC has some out clauses that really could prohibit teams from leaving until you really start to look financially and figure out what's going on with these teams. 20 million bucks a year was at 60 million over a three year period as currently constructed. There's about a $50 million out clause for anybody that's trying to get out of the contract before the TV deal is up in the ACC. With that, teams could look and go, look, for two or three years, and we could stretch this out. It's not like you got to have to pay $50 million right off the get go. You have that happen, you, you go ahead and you pay what you need to pay, and you recoup it in the SEC. I think it's a no brainer for the SEC. As currently constructed, think about Texas and Oklahoma are coming in, and that's going to make it, I believe, a 16-team conference up from the 14 that it is now. You add a Clemson and Florida State, all of a sudden that makes it 18. If you really believe it's going to be a 20-team conference, which is what a lot of people have talked about, then you find two additional teams. Now, Miami's interesting. They have the tradition football-wise. They're really good baseball-wise. Basketball, I know this year was an Elite Eight team, but not typically a team that you'd want running into the basketball conference because they're not normally great. But a program that's decided to invest $100 million in the football program, they have a world-class stadium, which is what they have right about now at Hard Rock Stadium. And the problem is they just don't get people to show up to any of the games. We'll continue this conversation here in just a second, but a moment, a word real quickly 
from our sponsors at Rock Auto, Rock Auto, excuse me, with the ever increasing numbers of makes and models, it's impossible now for your local chain auto parts store to keep up. You know how this goes. You go in there and you're looking for, let's just say floor mats. I've got a Kia. I'm driving my Kia. I want Kia floor mats. Guess what? My local auto parts store does not have this. They have aftermarket floor mats that don't necessarily fit the contour of your car. But if you go right now to Rock Auto, you can get exactly what you want. Just think, if you need floor mats again for your Kia K5 like I do, you can order mats for your Kia K5. They've been uh, in business over 20 years, reliably low. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck. Right, locked on in there. How did you hear about us? So they know that we sent you. It's an amazing selection, reliable low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. Again, I've ordered floor mats. Like legitimately, I had a Camaro. You go into whatever your chain store is, and you go in, you look for Camaro mats, and they have the aftermarket match, and you've got a pair of scissors trying to cut them out. Don't have those problems at RockAuto.com. What does the SEC ultimately do? They are going to expand. My estimation by the end of the year, you're going to have an idea where a bunch of these people are going to. Now, how does that affect Georgia? Right now, it doesn't. Clemson, yeah, would be on Georgia's level. Florida State and Miami, even if, if they get back to their best, awesome. You, you've got an unbelievable conference. But for right now, it's not really going to bother them. Georgia's still going to pull in top five recruiting classes as long as Kirby Smart and company's there. As long as Nick Saban's on the other time, those are the two favorites. Then you probably slot Clemson right underneath them. Then it's Oklahoma, maybe a little bit under there. And then the rest, you know, again, the LSUs and the Floridas and everybody else of the world, no disrespect to them. They're not on that level. You look at what Georgia's doing recruiting-wise. I know people got all up in arms. Oh, they lost a four-star recruit over the weekend. Um, he's class of 2024. And let me tell you what I don't worry about with Kirby Smart and company. Whatever the hell's happening with class of 2024, that is a long time from now, and it's a long time for a 16-year-old or 17-year-old potentially to go out, change his mind, take recruiting visits, fall in love with another school, and potentially circle right back to Georgia, realizing the dogs are going to be right there at the top. I saw an article this weekend that also said Georgia's one of the most likely teams to go undefeated in the regular season, and I think that's a no-brainer. You open against Oregon you're probably going to beat Oregon by about three touchdowns. And the rest of the schedule, currently Georgia is favored by more than 14 points over everybody. Tennessee, Auburn, Florida, Georgia Tech. They don't see Alabama. They don't see LSU. Who the heck's going to beat Georgia right now in the SEC? It's nobody. Let's go ahead and circle and pen it in. Georgia, Alabama in the SEC championship coming up in December. When we get back, are the Falcons going to be historically bad again? Or they can could they just be a little bit less than historically bad? Talk about that next here on the Locked On ATL podcast. John Michaels in for Zen here on the Locked On ATL Network. That's your boy John Michaels in for Z today. At John Michaels U is where you could give me a follow on social media. A lot of interaction there. This segment of the program brought to you by Bet Online. Appreciate them being part of the podcast network here. Again, go ahead and subscribe on YouTube. Follow on all social media, locked on ATL. Chuckery. Jarvis and Tanitra, Mark Zeno do an unbelievable job breaking down what's going on locally. We spent some time this morning on the locker room on 680 The Fan, Monday through Friday, 6 to 10, with myself, Brian Finneran, Joe Hamilton, home team Brandon Leak, and Hudson Mason. Yes, it takes a village to do one radio show. But we've been going position group by position group and looking at the Falcons roster as we're now just, what, three weeks away from training camp, trying to figure out, is this team – better situated in certain positions than they were potentially a year ago. The Falcons were historically bad last year, rushing the passer. When I say historically bad, when these numbers popped out, I knew they were bad. I knew 18 was the number of sacks a year ago. But when I looked and the next closest team sack-wise, who had a bad year as far as getting the quarterback on the ground was Philadelphia, at 29 sacks, you started to look at this Falcons team and go, how is that humanly possible that you only got the quarterback to the ground 18 times in a 17-game schedule? But that's exactly what they did. So we started looking, you know, is this team better situated than they were a year ago? And you think about some of the guys that are gone. Dante Fowler, gone. Good effort. Mm, you kind of stole money. Let's call it what it is. Steven Means, gone. You know, guy that tried hard. Obviously was uh, sat by an Achilles injury a couple of years ago. 
Good effort, good special teams guy. Not a guy that you necessarily needed coming off the edge 45 or 50 times a game. John Kaminsky, uh, a Thomas Dimitrov special. And, I, and TD was my guy, in fairness. I'm not going to badmouth him. I had a great relationship with Thomas in the time that he was here in Atlanta. But John Kaminsky, small school. We're going to try to show you we're smarter than everybody else. You went and got him. Mm, didn't really pan out. Some other guys, James Vauders. I think James Vauders last year, one game was the NFC Defensive Player of the Week, if I'm not mistaken. It was just like one of those anomalies where he had this unbelievable game. He's no longer with the ball club. So how do you replace him? You go draft Eva Cady out of Penn State, kid who has a lot of pass rushing capabilities. You go draft D'Angelo Malone, a kid out of Western Kentucky, again, that has the potential to go out and get the quarterback to the ground. You bring in a Lorenzo Carter who's five sacks, I think in the last five games for the Giants, would have led the Falcons a year ago in sacks, which is one of the dumbest stats in the history of dumb stats when it comes to a ball club. The fact that five sacks would lead your ball club. Obviously, you re-up with Grady Jarrett. Uh, love Grady as a person, but he's got to give me more than one sack than he gave us a year ago. You also are another year into Dean Pease's system. And you, you know, Taquan Graham should maybe take a step. I think it's Vincent Taylor, big fatty you'll plug in the middle. Anthony Rush, who I really liked a year ago, another guy that you can plug into the middle, maybe get him some more time. But you've got to find ways to affect the quarterback. I put an over-under poll up, again, at John Michaels U. I said, would you take the over or under right now when it comes to the Atlanta Falcons sack number? And I put 29 and a half. We'll dissect that in just a second. But a word from our sponsor, betonline.net, your number one source for all your betting needs. Uh, maybe they'll have a, a prop in there. Over under 29 and a half sacks for the Atlanta Falcons. I'd have to imagine the under is where you'd want to be. But betonline.net remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. You want to head to the website right now. Check them out betonline.net. Again, betonline.net, your number one source for all your betting needs. Uh, maybe no surprise with what's going on in social media, but when I put that Twitter poll out, and I'm trying to check live exactly right now where we're at. Falcon fans, a uh, lot of votes on this deal. 89% said they'd take the under of 29 and a half. I'll argue right now, though, the Falcons defensive line this year is better than it was last year. Again, Lorenzo Carter, in a prove-it contract-ish kind of year, he wants to come in, and he's a local kid, played college football at Georgia, wants to come in, get guys to the ground. You bring in Malone, and you know I'm not even talking about Anderson, uh, the young kid out of Montana. I'm talking about Malone, a pass rusher. You know, you're know, you bringing in other pieces that we talked about earlier on, guys that can maybe affect the quarterback, Eba Cady, uh, big defensive end. You know, these guys, you'd have to think they stumble into four or five sacks. Really? Four or five sacks? That's, that's not exactly saying a whole lot when it comes to the NFL. There were players individually who had more sacks than the Atlanta Falcons did a year ago. And I think one of the things that can help them, and we were talking about this some this morning as well, A.J. Terrell is now starting to develop into a lockdown-ish kind of quarter, cornerback. You now add a Casey Hayward on the other side. You get a high, healthy Isaiah Oliver back, and that should be the three guys that you trot out there in the secondary on a normal basis. You hope Richie Grant plays better at the safety position, Eric Harris back another year. The reason I bring up defensive backs, Fabian Moreau, Kendall Sheffield, those, those were just not good football players. And you could line up and go, all right, Moreau's over here. He's giving a cushion. Boom, I'm raising up and throwing the ball, and you have no chance to get a quarterback to the ground. I think this year, with the with especially with Hayward, you potentially can cover for a couple of minutes, not a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds, instead of it, you know, you needing to get to the quarterback in one and a half seconds. Maybe now if you get there in three seconds, you have a chance for that to happen. Will they get to 29 and a half? That doesn't seem like an attainable number unless something really, really changes, especially when you look at the beginning of the schedule and you're playing really good quarterbacks. Here's some numbers I think I need. I need six sacks out of Grady Jarrett. Six. That's not asking a lot for a guy that you just gave a very nice extension to. He is capable of that, maybe with some help on the outside. I need Lorenzo Carter to give me eight. If you're a premier-ish, and I'm being very nice when I use premier, type edge rusher, 
you need to get me in the neighborhood of seven or eight sacks if you're Lorenzo Carter. So if that happens, six for Grady, eight for Lorenzo right there, all of a sudden you're starting to look at 14. Malone, you know, Eba Katie combined, give me 12. I don't care how that combination comes. 12. So 12, six, and eight. That gets me to 26. The rest of the team should be able to come up with four sacks somehow. Fall into four sacks. What I don't want to hear this year, though, out of Dean Pease is I only put put a percentage, 46% of my defense in. No, no, no. If these guys can't learn the defense, get their asses off the team. This is a rebuild year for the Falcons. I think we all know it. But I need to see incremental steps to make me think that next year I can maybe be a quarterback away from going out and getting the guys that I need. Take a break. When we get back, we're going to dive into what happened with the Atlanta Braves. The Mets, guess what? We're getting closer. Better watch yourself. It's coming up next here on A to Z on Locked on ATL. John Michaels at John Michaels U hanging out with you. One more segment to go. This segment brought to you by our good buddies at Coffee AM. Coffee AM. They'll get you up in the morning. When you wake up my time of the morning, you need to do whatever you can to get up and get out of bed. Uh, a couple of things going on baseball-wise. Uh, Sal Licata, our good friend from WFAN. I use that term very loosely. Our good friend who made fun of the station that I currently work at. He made fun of the Braves. Braggadociously back in May, he said, the NL East is over. The NL East is done. And suddenly he's, yeah, he's had to walk it back and walk it out like he's DJ Unk. That's uh, what he really had to do because that 10 and a half game lead magically is down to three and a half. It actually got to two and a half. And then unfortunately the Braves bullpen wasted what was a magnificent outing from Charlie Morton the other day. They blow a game late to the Cincinnati Braves did win last night on 4th of July with all the rain and everything about two and a half hour rain delay. They pick up a win six to three. Good news for the Braves is 24 and seven over the last 31 games. I mean, it is just absolutely phenomenal what they're doing. Beat a good team in St. Louis yesterday. Obviously won three or four against the Giants. Did lose two out of three to the Dodgers, but that's all fine and dandy. Second good part of everything, the, the starting pitching. My goodness. Max Fried, great. Spencer Strider, great. Charlie Morton had a one-hitter through seven innings. Uh, and then last night, Kyle Wright was going to pick up his 10th win if it wasn't for the rain delay. And he ended up having to go out after four innings and sit for two and a half hours, didn't come back and get a chance to get the win. Which, by the way, baseball. So I get the rule. Five innings pitch gets you in line for the win. When you have a long-ass rain delay like that, like maybe there should be a time limit, an hour or two if there is a rain delay, maybe an hour. If your starting pitcher has to sit an hour and can't come back in and he's in line for the win when the rain delay happens, how about give him the win? Kyle Wright would have his 10th win. And maybe I'm, uh, Mark Zeno would yell at me. He's a baseball purist. He would get mad that things aren't you know going perfectly. But I'm just like, you know what? He was going to get the dub. It was 6-1 to one when he exited the game. He would have been able to pitch one or two more innings. But to back to this point, not, not to kind of go off on a tangent, but Braves are doing tremendous work pitching the baseball. If there is one concern for this baseball team right now, it is the back end of the bullpen. And Kenley Jansen will be back on July the 12th. At least that's the reports that are out there. He's dealt with the irregular heartbeat before. Should be back to having that thing. Uh, taken care of in July 12th, he'll be back. The Will Smith roller coaster is back from a year ago. I swear, watching Will Smith is like being on a ride at Six Flags. You go up, you go down, you go up, you're down, you're spinning all around, and you hope, you hope by God, at the end of the day, you come out healthy. Last night, he's got bases loaded, 6-3 to three game, Albert Pujols, thank goodness. He yanks one down the left field line, looked like a home run. Uh, it ended up being a foul ball, and then he gets a weak grounder back, and you get up out of there, and the Braves win 6-3. to three. The guy that hasn't been pitching well, other than Will Smith, gets a start tonight, and that's your boy Ian Anderson. And we talked some about Ian last week. The last two starts just have not been very good for Ian Anderson. So we shall see if this is a scenario where Ian Anderson can bounce back today against a good St. Louis team. But some reinforcements arrive. So if you're a Braves fan, you feel happy. You go back over the weekend, Adam Duvall, unfortunately, hit by a pitch in the left hand. X-ray's negative. He shouldn't be out a long time. Eddie Rosario was back last night, came into a rousing Eddie, Eddie, Eddie chant there at Truist Park, ended up getting a hit, one of his four hits on the year, which is amazing, hit a line drive single to right field. You need Eddie Rosario back because I think for more than anything, it really balances out 
what the lineup is. The, the lineup had become a little bit right-handed heavy with Duvall, Acuna, obviously, and Ozuna being guys that kind of filled two of the three outfield spots and your D8 spot. Or if it's William Contreras, he's in there as well. Your only lefties right now were Matt Olson and Michael Harris. Well, now you get another one in there with Eddie Rosario. When you get Ozzy Albies back, Whenever that may be, you're going to get him back in a switch hitting capacity, and I think that balances out the lineup a little bit better. So that was good to see. Tyler Matzik back from AAA. You much need his arm. Hopefully the arm that was back from October a year ago where he was lights out and getting people out. We'll continue the Braves conversation in just a second, but a word from our good friends at Coffee AM. is Coffee never tasted so good, ATL, and it's the best small batch coffee roaster right here in Atlanta. You can use a coupon code right now for 15% off all coffees, teas, and gift sets. It's pretty simple. Locked on. Put that all in there. They've got the freshest coffee you can get. Most are roasted and shipped the same day. You want to go right now to coffeeam.com backslash locked on and take uh, take a look at their full menu of coffees, teas, and gift sets. Again, that's coffeeam.com backslash locked on. Use a coupon code locked on at checkout and get 15% off your first order of coffees, teas, and gift sets. Coffee AM, the best small batch coffee roaster in America and Atlanta as well. I drink some coffee AM in the morning. Again, when you get up 4.30 in the morning, you need something to get yourself rolling. Braves have continued to roll, and like I said, that lead down to three and a half. A couple other things Braves related. I saw a stat yesterday, and maybe it's because I don't watch as much baseball as I should on a night. Like, I watch the Braves, but I'm not all – a lot of times it's with the volume down, and I'm watching the game, and I'm looking to see what's going on. I'm not necessarily paying attention to all the graphics and infomercials they put up. I've never heard the stat barreled balls before last night or barreling up a pitch. I get it. Exit velo, how important that is. But there was literally a stat on the Bally – I think it was Bally Sports last night that said the Braves – lead the majors in barreled balls. Who comes up with this? Like, who is the guy that's sitting in an analytics room and goes, you know what? We're going to go back and watch every single swing, every single at-bat of everybody and find out if it's a barreled ball or not. Now, a lot of that has to do, I believe it's the exit velocity has to be over 90, whatever. It was just a stat. We learn things new every day in sports. It was a stat I, quite frankly, had never seen on a major league broadcast. But I think what you need right now, Kenley Jansen back. You need Tyler Matzikin. Move Will Smith back to the eighth inning role. Get guys back in their design slots. I'd actually probably put A.J. Minter in the eighth inning role. Let everybody else sort of fall into place and get this thing going. This is a baseball club that absolutely has a chance to make a deep run of good again in October. Real quick, quick before we get out of here. We, and we talked a lot of NBA on Friday. The Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving situation rubs me the wrong way because it's held up the remainder of trades and or free agency. Somebody asked me this on YouTube the other day. Did I feel Kevin Durant was holding up the rest of the NBA? And the answer is yes. Because you think about teams that potentially have called about Kevin Durant and haven't been told outright no, which I'm sure Brooklyn has told some people kick rocks, you guys are done. You're not a part of this. Outside of those teams, people are probably holding off. And, and how does it affect somebody like the Hawks? Now, the Hawks made a move. Kevin Herter sent to Sacramento in exchange. Justin Holiday. they bring back Mo Harkless in a first-round pick. I get it. It was cap. It was recoup a first-round pick for all the picks that you sent out uh, earlier to go get DeJounte Murray. You know, you maybe had a log jam at shooting guard with, with Bogey Bogdanovich and obviously DeJounte Murray and, and Kevin Herter. I would not personally have traded Kevin Herter. That's me because I thought he was the second best pure shooter on this basketball team, only behind Trey Young. But what's happened with this Kevin Durant situation impacts what's going on with John Collins. And think about this for a second. And I, and I use Miami for an example because the Heat had been linked not only to John Collins, but to Donovan Mitchell and to Kevin Durant. Well, Pat Riley is not going to put anything together right now that doesn't include Kevin Durant and or Donovan Mitchell. Maybe his contingency ultimately ends up being John Collins. But if you're the Hawks, you have to sit back now and wait. If you're the Lakers and maybe you wanted a John Collins, and I, and I don't know that they do, but if you maybe have wanted a John Collins, they're not going to make any moves until they figure out what's happening with Kyrie Irving or Russell Westbrook. As much, and I am a huge player advocate. I, I love everybody in athletics, go get your money because nothing is guaranteed in sports. The NBA, though, 
has become a whiny person's league. You don't like you go ahead, sign you a five year, $250 million max extension. That's awesome. Sign it. But if you want to cry your way out of town in a year from now, you can do so. Brooklyn bet on Kevin Durant. And he's given him 90 games, 90 in three years. They paid him a full year salary to sit and rehab his Achilles. And I get it. You got arguably the best player on the planet, but you're screwing up the rest of the NBA. The Hawks can't figure like Landry Fields and, and Travis Schlink can't put together the roster that they want. And maybe it is. Maybe, maybe the Kevin Herter move was the last one. Me thinking outside the box, they've tried to get rid of John Collins or his name's been in rumors now for like two and a half years. Kevin Durant, Brooklyn, figure it out. Either stay or trade his ass. And let's let the rest of the NBA get on with their business. Now, in fairness, Brooklyn owes Kevin Durant zero, nothing. Don't know him a damn thing. They can tell him, kick rocks, you're going to either play for us or you're not. You want to sit out like Ben Simmons, sit out. Because what they know is Kevin Durant's a guy that loves ball. He loves basketball. He ain't, I don't think he's a guy that wants to sit out. But the flip side is, What's your return on investment at that point if you're handing a guy close to $42 million, $43 million? It's nothing. My point to this, how it affects the Hawks, I'd like to see the Hawks roster in full. See it in full. Stop waiting. John Collins, Clint Capella, whoever the hell else they may move. Let's get – DeAndre Ayton can't find a sign and trade until Kevin Durant and Brooklyn figure out what they're doing. We'll be back tomorrow. Really appreciate it. You guys go ahead and uh, subscribe. Locked on Atlanta. Locked on ATL. Download it on YouTube, subscribe on YouTube, follow everywhere. You can follow me as well, at John Michaels U. Till tomorrow, in for Zen as well then. Have a great rest of your day.